We're going to go old school this morning. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I hope this morning you're able to worship the Lord knowing that he came and he died on the cross and three days later he rose up and washed as white as snow. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? You sing. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but Jesus. For my part in this I see. Come on. For my cleansing, this I plead. Come on! Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So true, nothing can for sin atone. Nothing can for sin atone. Yeah, not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious. Oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No. I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Come on, choir. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. at this time as we transition to an attitude of reflection and reminding ourselves what God has done with us. You may be seated, by the way. What God has done in our lives. We're going to move to the tithes and the offerings this morning as a time of reflection and giving back to what the Lord has done in our lives. We give back just a fraction of what, what he's given to us. Dear Heavenly Father, this morning, As we come to the altar, as we, as we remind ourselves that no, no good that I have done, Lord God, it's only by your grace that we are saved, Lord God, in your love that endures. Lord, this morning as, as we go to tithes and offerings, I pray that you put your hand on our hearts, Lord God, and, remind, and be reminded that you love us. There's nothing that we can do, Lord God. It's only by your grace. Bless us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Oh, yeah. 
hurting and broken within Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open. Regrets and mistakes, leave them all. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life was born. Jesus is calling.
bear your cross as you wait for the crown tell the world of the treasure you find In this series in Proverbs chapter 3 this morning, specifically picking up in verse 21, um, I want to talk this morning about some top drawer tools, some, some things that uh, the Proverbs, uh, Solomon through the Proverbs instructs us to keep close by us. Um, my, one of my grandfathers uh, was a diesel mechanic in Altoona, Pennsylvania for years and years before uh, some corporate things shifted around and uh, he got into the dairy farming business. And so he was a, a little bit of a, of a grease monkey. He knew a thing or two about how to fix things. And uh, I remember as a kid going out to his old and musty farm garage and, you know, you, you just can kind of remember the creak of the floorboards and the smell of the grease, Right. And if you've ever been in a, your, your dad's or uh, your grandfather's or maybe you personally have a garage, right? You know somewhere in the back of that garage past all the old used uh, oil filter boxes and all the things that are stacked up in front of it is a big old uh, tool chest, right? And if you're a real good mechanic, if you are uh, smart and wise, you organize that tool chest in a certain way so that the most important tools are on top, right? They're your top drawer tools. And every job, you don't have to be a mechanic for this to be true, right? Every job has a version of this. There are certain Chrome tabs on your browser you just always keep open, right? It's just always there at a click of a button. You can go over there and grab it. You've got a shortcut to it, right? That's the old school PC days thing. You make it, remember when you used to do that? Make a shortcut, shortcut on your desktop to that specific document, right? These are all examples of top drawer tools, right? The idea that we, we, there are things that we don't want to lose track of. In, in, a, in a mechanics, you know, uh, tool chest, it's, it's, the, it's the quarter inch and half inch drive ratchets, right? It's, these are things you're going to use for every job. Um, it's, a, it, it's a pair, it's a set somewhere down there. There's some cable ties, right? Because if things really go wrong, you can always use cable ties or duct tape, right? <laughs> uh, these are things you keep on hand. And Proverbs tells us about two of these things uh, it, when it comes to spiritual life, when it comes to life in general in chapter 3, verse 21. Look there if you will. You'll see what I'm talking about. He says, my son, do not lose sight of these. Don't lose them. Keep them close by. My son, do not lose sight of these. What are they? Sound wisdom and discretion. And they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. Verse 23 says, then you'll walk on your way securely. And your foot will not stumble. If you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Oh, doesn't that sound good, right? Don't be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked when it comes, for the Lord will be with you. describes the life of a person who keeps these two top drawer tools where they belong, at cl close at hand, at reach. Never lose sight of these two things. Sound wisdom and discretion. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when I was with you. Uh, we went through Proverbs chapter 2. But the Proverbs is an interesting book for a lot of reasons. And, and one of the reasons is the way that it, is, it, it teaches from a literary standpoint. It uses a lot of synonyms, right? Synonyms meaning words that are close in meaning. And the depth, right? The, the real meat of the Proverbs is in the difference between two words that are close to each other but aren't quite the same thing. 
Sound wisdom and discretion are, are an example of that. And if you were to pull out your concordance and look at the original languages, you could do a deep dive study. You don't have to be able to read Hebrew to be able to, to find these things out. We live in the technology age where you can do a search and you can find these things out. And if you've never played around with that, I would love to show you how to do it because I'm a nerd, especially when it comes to the Bible. So, But these two terms in Hebrew that we translate sound wisdom and discretion, they are. They are synonyms. They're very close to each other. They're closely related. But they're not the same thing. Sound wisdom, uh, one, one way that uh, other translators or commentators have translated this idea is resourcefulness. Resourcefulness. That's a little more specific, isn't it? My son, do not lose sight of these things. Keep resourcefulness. The, the ability, this inner power that helps somebody to escape a fix. That was a quote from a commentator on this passage. It says, this is what this word means. It's an inner power that we have, that we can possess, that will help us to escape a fix. Now, when I was working on this, I instantly thought of a TV show character that I've actually, and I'll, I'll confess to you this morning, this is sort of embarrassing, I, I guess, maybe not because of my age, but I've never actually seen an episode of it, but it made me think of MacGyver. How many of you grew up on MacGyver? Okay, so I got a couple of you in the room, so you know who I'm talking about, right? This guy has resourcefulness. He has an ability to, to duct tape and cable tie his way, right, out of anything. Resourcefulness. So that's if that helps you, great. If you've never seen MacGyver and don't know who I'm talking about, you can Google it later. But for those of you that have seen the show, it'll be helpful for our discussion today. It's an inner power. And so this is what I, what I, when I think of sound wisdom, this is what I want us to think about. When we seek God, he will give us a way where there seems to be no way. When we seek God, which is what the beginning of wisdom is, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's a relationship more than it is school. But when we seek God, he shows us ways where everybody else would look and say, there's no way we can make that happen. How many of you from experience in your walk with God can say an amen to that? That's resourcefulness from a scriptural standpoint. Sound wisdom. That other word, discretion. It's very similar but another, another word that gets thrown around by, the, by people who study the Hebrew and, and, and try and, and sort of parse a difference between these two ideas of sound wisdom and discretion. This discretion here is shrewdness or cunning. It's the ability to make a plan, right? To be able to have vision. It's that quarterback, right? Who has the three... 250-pound lineman barreling down his neck, right? He has a split second to have full vision, right, of the field, to be able to see the receiver that just got open over here and zip that ball across the field before he gets totally pummeled. That is that is discretion a pra- in its practical sense. It is this ability to be shrewd, to be cunning, to be fast, quick, because you can see things. That other people can't see. How many of us know God gives us this ability as Christians? Through the Holy Spirit. He helps us to see a world where everybody else sees chaos and would just imagine yourself in the shoes of that quarterback, right? What would you do? Right, tuck that ball and hit the ground, right? <laughs> I, can't, I can't make heads or tails of this situation. But through the Holy Spirit, he gives us this ability to see with his eye. This whole idea, you know, when we say shrewd, when we say cunning, it's usually a negative thing, right? We would not we would not typically assign that positive, like a positive moral value. But it's interesting because in the New Testament, Jesus uses that idea, doesn't he? Twice, two different times. In Luke 16, he says that the sons of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. He says one of the problems with people, the religious people, is that they're dumb. They, they're not thinking at the same level as, some, as, as even sinners in the world. And he says, that's, that's not right. God's people should be wise people. Amen? 
We, we should have divine wisdom. We should be able to see things from a perspective that the rest of the world doesn't have. Luke, Matthew 10, Jesus says something similar. He says, behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as, everybody remember how it goes? Wise as what? Serpents. And innocent as doves. Again, we don't usually assign like positive moral values to the image of a serpent, right? But what Jesus is saying is, I don't want you to be evil like a serpent. I want you to be innocent as doves, but I want you to think like a snake. Snakes are, snakes are tricky. They're fast. They can see their way out, right? I, I can't tell you how many times I was mowing when I was, uh, when I was working a couple of summers as a guy, mowing lawns in Sebring, that I'd be doing my thing, just mowing along on my big zero-turn mower, and I'd see a trace of black go that way, right? He d I had no idea that black racer snake was right there, but he saw me coming, and he got out, right? Shrewdness, cunning. Don't lose sight of these, he says. Sound wisdom and discretion, shrewdness and resourcefulness. You're going to need these. How many of you could say amen? We're going to need these in this world we live in. Because as we've been saved by grace through faith and called to be Christ's disciples, we're part of two different worlds, aren't we? We're part of that kingdom of heaven that Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, this kingdom of light. But we're living in the midst of a broken and chaotic world, right? And, and, and so often what that can feel like, if we try and achieve it, try and work it out in the flesh, is it feels like being caught between a rock and a hard place. We're going to need resourcefulness. We're going to need to, to, to lean on God in his ways, not mine. We're going to need to lean on his vision, not because I, I can't see. I'm going to need these things. And it says, and it's so beautiful, that they will be life to your soul and adornment around your neck. You can have all the money in the world. You can have all the fame in the world. You can have all the success in the world. If you don't have these two things, you're going to look broke and you're going to be sad. <laughs> but if you have sound wisdom and discretion that can only come from our Heavenly Father, you, it will be life to your soul and adornment around your neck. You'll walk I, I love how it does this, right? It, 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 it just doubles down with these illustrations. You'll, when you walk, you'll walk securely. When you lie down, you won't be afraid. You won't be afraid of sudden terror or the ruin of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and keep your foot from being caught. So what do we do? How does a Christian deal in this broken world with all kinds of challenges that it brings, whether it's financial questions, relational problems, when it comes to s the suffering of, of, of abuse and persecution and the things that we face as Christians, right? How do we deal with these things? God's not left us alone to, with, without answers. He's provided them to us in his word. And so what we're going to see with the rest of our time is I want to look at two principles. That the, that the next couple of verses and a, and a couple of verses from chapter 6 are going to give us that relate to these two words, sound wisdom and discretion, this resourcefulness and this cunningness, this shrewdness. And what we're going to talk about are principles, two principles, okay? And I, I want to kind of define that at the outset because it's going to be really easy for us to go in and try and make out of Proverbs rules, I didn't say, these are, these are scriptural commands. And I want to be careful to say they're not commands because it's in the scriptures. right? But we have to be a little bit more nuanced in our understanding than what sometimes we are when we read our Bible. And we say, well, it's a command from God in the book, so I have to do it to the T. And what, what I think sound wisdom and discretion is, is the ability to take these, these truths understand the principle that they are trying to teach, and then apply the general principle, general principle, apply it to my specific situation. It's going to take, it's going to take work. It's going to take communication with our Heavenly Father who inspired these things sometimes, right, to, to figure out, how do I get out of this bind? How do I get out of this fix? How do, how do I spiritually MacGyver my way, not, not trying to get away with something, but, but through the power that the Spirit has given me, through the love of my Heavenly Father, through these truths, see a way out where there doesn't seem to be a way out. So we're going to take general truths 
and wisely and prayerfully apply them to specific, our specific life situation. So, what's the first general principle? General principle, right? General principle is this, the people first principle. We're going to look at a, a couple of verses that are don't necessarily at the first look connected, but I, I think in the next, ne- next five, ten minutes, we're going to see how they are connected and how the one thing they really instruct us is that people are first. The people first principle. Look at verse 27 with me, and we're going to see a, a, a list, a list of, of, of lines that say do not. And that's going to, by the way, it's going to trigger in our, in our head that, okay, this is a command. This is to take, be taken literally and applied literally to every single situation. And I want to say pause, right? We're using wisdom, sound wisdom and discretion here. We're looking at principles, not commands. Okay. With all that being said, look at verse 27. Um, Do not withhold good from those whom it is due. When it is in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again. Tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. Do not plan evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly beside you. Do not contend with a man for no reason when he has done you no harm. Do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. For the devious person is an abomination to the Lord, but the upright are his confidence. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor The wise will inherit honor, but fools get disgrace. So this is verses 28, especially there through verse 33. These four, what we see are five proverbs that amount to four examples of this people first principle. The first one... um, The first one is in uh, verses 27 and 28. And before we read that, I just want to make this point. Uniting all these ideas, remember, is what? The people first principle. That people, in God's wisdom, problems are resolved when the value of the other person in the scenario is near the top of our list of concerns when we're making a decision. That's what I mean by the people first principle. That I'm in a situation, I don't know how to solve this financial challenge. I don't know how to solve this work-related challenge. I don't know how to solve this parenting challenge. Well, if you have, if you're solving that without people first being a, a guiding principle, the value of other people, being a guiding principle, and you're not walking in sound wisdom and discretion. But if your first concern is how to serve the person you're in conflict with, if your first concern is not the money but the people, if your first concern is how to lead them to Christ or to lead them closer in their walk with Christ, then a lot of your questions, a lot of these rock and hard place situations just very easily start to be illuminated. Because we'll stop thinking primarily about who? Ourselves. Let God take care of me, and I'll start thinking about others. He plays that out in a couple of really practical examples, right? The first one we have on the screen, which is uh, the the situation we've all been in, right, of needing to pay somebody. Or perhaps pay somebody back. How many of you know there's, there's really only one, there's, there's one surefire way to make a relationship weird. And that's start to get money involved, right? Because people get weird when it comes to money. Usually because we worship it like an idol, but we'll get into that another time. He says, don't withhold good from those to whom it is due. When it is in your power to do it. That's a pretty general term. He's not talking 
uh, specifically about money there. He says, don't, don't say to your neighbor, go and come again tomorrow, I will give it. Now, this could be a thing you lent, this could be any number of things, right? It doesn't have to be money, but money is obviously the most frequent uh, thing we see in this in our day. Don't say to your neighbor, go and come again, tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. If you have the ability to pay that person back or to pay them for services rendered or to give that thing that you, they that, that uh, they lent you back to them, whatever it is, right? Put the person first. Do we see how that's the principle behind here, behind what's being said? Sound wisdom and discretion says if they come to collect and you have it, give it to them. It's as simple as that. Because how many times have you been walking around your house and you found that thing that book, if this is for me, books. If you ever lend me a book, it might, you might as well just consider it a gift. Because I'm never going to give that back. Like, I'll start it, I'll leave it on the, the side of my desk, I'll find it six months later, I'll read a couple more chapters, and then a year later I'll think, I really need to give that back. And Pastor Cam at Grace Bible is awesome because he's probably the one that I've stolen the most books from. But every time I see certain books, I think to myself, man, I need to take that back to camp. Right Now, if Cam were to come and collect his books, and he said, okay, it's time to pay the piper, Pastor Ben. I need my books back, right? We shouldn't say, well, I'll, come, I'll go do that tomorrow. No, in fact, in wisdom, I'm going to say, no, this is the opportunity I've been waiting for, right, <laughs> to make this right. Um, so it's confession time with Pastor Ben this morning, apparently. But, <laughs> but, but this, is, this is important here, right? Because it, even in this first layer of the examples, and it's going to get more and more extreme, we're going to get down to at full on violence against somebody by the end of this. The principle that's being laid out is this. It's not enough, according to divine wisdom, according to sound wisdom and, and discretion, just to not ever hurt somebody. Well, well, it's in my right, theoretically, if somebody lends me money or I owe them, like I have 30 days to pay the invoice, right? But sound wisdom and discretion says, if I have the money, I should just send the check. Because I value the person more than I value my stuff. I value the person more than I value the number that's at the bottom of my checking account when I log in on my mobile banking app, right? That, that, that's a bigger deal. That I never even get close to the place where there's something between me and a brother or a sister. That's way more important than holding on to a little bit of money. Than holding on to something somebody borrowed me. We don't even want to get close to owing somebody something. And that's going to come up later. So i got to move on to the next one. What's the next one? Verse 29, he says, Don't plan evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly beside you. And this is so the second example of, of, um, it, of negative example is breaking trust. So the thing that sound wisdom and discretion says is trust is hard to build. How many of you can say that's true? All right, trust is hard to build in a marriage with a neighbor with a coworker, we live in a world where we, by default, don't trust each other, and that's for good reason because people aren't often to be trusted. So he says, "Don't go around just breaking trust with people." I called. I I I, I wanted to call this the the punch buggy yellow principle, right? Don't plot evil against your neighbor when he's dwelling trustingly beside you, right? There's nothing more annoying than sitting on a car ride. Everybody's just humming along, doing their own thing, and then suddenly, out of nowhere, somebody punches you in the arm, right? <laughs> Maybe I'm just person. I have a personal problem with that, but don't plan evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly beside you, <laughs> right? Because um, now I'm going to flinch for the rest of the car ride every time you move. But man, we do this to each other, right? We do this to each other in our neighborhoods. We do this to each other with our siblings, right? This is, the, this is the spouse who keeps secrets. This is the sibling who bears false witness <laughs> to a parent or to a teacher, a classmate, who throws us under the bus. The neighbor who gossips. Trust is hard to build, so don't throw it away. That's what sound wisdom and discretion says, right? So we're getting into the really negative stuff here in this list. The third example is in verse 30. Don't contend with a man for no reason when he has done you no harm. This is really similar to the one before it. Now, again, that's how the Proverbs work. 
Similar truths stacked on top of each other, slightly different from each other. Don't contend with a man for no reason when he has done you no harm. How many of you have somebody in your life who likes to argue for argument's sake? (laughs) Oh, yeah. This is like, this is a sport in America, right? This is who we are. We're argumentative. We've got our opinions. We know most of them are wrong, but we're sticking to them. We want everybody to know about it. We develop our tribes based on what I think about this. And that, you know, the most silly example, this is sports. It's about to be football season, right? And man, it's like, it doesn't matter if you're on the, even if you're buddies with the guy and you root for the same team, you'll still get into argument for argument's sake. Well, no, Brady's really trash, right? Brady, he, he didn't even show up for postseason. And we'll just argue for argument's sake. And, and what wise Sound wisdom and discretion says is this. Winning an argument and losing a person is always a loss in God's economy, according to divine wisdom. There's a lot of discussions. There's a lot of arguments. There's a lot of contention that we ought to just walk away from, right? It's just not worth it. Because what do we gain? Don't contend with a man for no reason (laughs) when he has done you no harm. An argumentative spirit says, my opinions, my position is superior, so, and allow me to demonstrate, right? Let me win this argument. But I love this proverb. This is Proverbs 26, 17. Whoever meddles in a quarrel not his own is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears. Right? What's the, what's the guy who takes a passing dog by the ears get? The teeth, Right? And we think of dogs in a positive light. In the ancient world, dogs were not domesticated at the extent that they are now, right? And so you're going to get bit by a rabid dog is what happens when you meddle in a quarrel that isn't your own. Man, we jump right into that these days, don't we? It's the next one. This is like, this is like the, we now see how these are connected, right? It starts with do what you can to bless somebody. Even if it's not your legal responsibility, bless them anyway. Pay them early because people are more important than money. Don't, don't break the trust of your neighbor. Don't argue with somebody for no reason. And certainly don't do this. Don't, don't envy a man of violence and don't choose any of his ways. For the devious person is an abomination to the Lord, but the upright are his, are his confidence. And as I put the term up there, fantasized violence, right? Because most of us, we're grown-ups, right? We know. We know we can't hit, punch, kick, do all the things we used to do in the elementary school playground, right? Or with our siblings. But if we're all honest, we think about doing it, uh, at least fantasize, dream, imagine what it would be like to punch that person on an occasional basis, right? In that scenario, in that situation where they come up and they argue with us for no reason, right? And he's he says, as charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. He says, you're just going to make things worse. And so wise, sound wisdom and discretion says, imagining or acting on our our impulse to physical violence never fixes anything, right? It always makes things worse. And that's what that other proverb is saying. It's just fuel to the fire. But man, as we live in a day of where where the discourse and civility, right, it just continues to decline, right? It's all because we've lost sight of sound wisdom and discretion, which says the most important thing isn't your money. The most important thing isn't your rec- reputation. The most important thing isn't your success. The most important thing isn't your team, your political uh, opinions, the most important thing that's in this room are all the other people. And Jesus didn't just come to die for your sins, he came and he died for your neighbor's sins, even if they voted for the other candidate. Even if they do root for the wrong football team. <laughs> even if their opinions do rub us the wrong way. Even if they do owe us money. <laughs> wow. People first. 
We see this play out in another passage that, that adds to this people first principle one more thing, and that is proactivity, the proactivity principle. These two things, right, like sound wisdom and discretion, if we were to plug them in, if we were to embrace them, if they were to become part of our, the way we operated in our lives as the church, as dads, as moms, as teachers, as whatever you are, right? It would change the way you lived. If you thought about people first, and if you took a proactive stance, that's the second principle. Look at it in verse 6, chapter 6, verse 1. My son, if you've put up security for your neighbor, have given pledge to, for a stranger, if you are snared in the words of your mouth, caught in the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, and save yourself. For you, have come in, for you have come into the hand of your neighbor. Go, hasten, and plead urgently with your neighbor. Give, no eye, give your eyes no sleep, your eyelids no slumber, but save yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the hand of the fowler. Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any ruler, officer, uh, any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When, you, when will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. I've never read these two sections as connected before, but I really do think they're both talking about the same thing. They are talking about this piece of sound wisdom and discretion, that, that the way that God looks at things, the way God would live, the way Jesus would, would, would act if he were in us. Wait a second. Jesus is in us. <laughs> and, and so G Christ in us, the Holy Spirit in us, wants to move us to proactivity, to action. And it gives these two examples. The first one is a relational example. So it's relational proactivity. And he gives this scenario. If, if, what are the ifs? What's the scenario that's being played out here? You guys can yell it out. I know that Pastor Michael was trying to get you to do this last week, too. And it went real well then, too. What's the if? In your own words. Nobody's a taker. But we're thinking, right? What, we are vouching for somebody else. If you've put up security for your neighbor, right, security, we know that's a financial term, right? So putting up security for a neighbor looks like some kind of financial arrangement. We have given your pledge for a stranger. It could also be that. And so it's got, and if everybody's a Dave Ramsey fan, they, they know this verse really well. Because this is Dave Ramsey's favorite verse, I think. And he, he uses it to apply to, this is why Christians and anybody who's wise should just go real quick and pay off their debt, which is also a good wise principle. But it applies to way bigger things than debt. And we see that in verse 2, right? If you are snared in the words of your mouth, if you are caught in the words of your mouth, has anybody ever been there? You make an agreement. You make a promise. You make a contract. You try to let your yes be yes. Try to be a person of integrity. And guess what? We live in a broken world. So we can do our best. We can try as hard as we may to be the kind of person who is a person of integrity, who makes their yes, yes, and their no, no, who is a person of their word, and we still sometimes get caught in the words of our mouth. Am I alone in this? Okay, good. So if we're in this place and the, and the business dealing's gone bad, 
the contract deadline's up. And because of things that we couldn't, uh, couldn't control, or maybe some things we could control, but we messed up, right, because we're not perfect, we find ourselves in this situation. If we're snared in the words of our mouth, if we said made a commitment and we can't keep it, we're, we're in a situation where we're afraid we're not going to be able to keep it. This is a very familiar scenario, isn't it? And, and, and what is the thing we are to do? Do this. I love it. Mm, okay. What are we going to do? Save yourself, he says, give your eyes no sleep. Go hasten and plead urgently with your neighbor. Go to talk to them face to face. Don't send a text. <laughs> Don't send an email. Just go. Oh, and hurry about going. And plead with your neighbor because you're about to get caught, he says. Sound wisdom and discretion says if you're ever in this situation, move now to protect the relationship. Don't wait. Don't wait to see if the money comes in another week or two. Don't wait until the, the thing is up and now they're thinking bad thoughts about you and you can't sleep at night because if you've ever been there, right, that's not a fun place to be. He says, fix your problem with a little proactivity. Go now, he says. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 5. I love it. He says, come to terms quickly with your accuser when you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you'll be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until they have paid the last penny. It's a section of the Sermon on the Mount that apart from this principle that's in the Proverbs doesn't make a ton of sense. What's Jesus telling us to do, right? But what he's saying is, don't let the legal repercussions come. Go deal with it relationally now. Confess the sin to your spouse now. Apologize to your brother and sister in Christ today. Don't wait. And he gives this beautiful illustration, two illustrations one about deer and the other about birds. And if you've ever been in the woods, hunting or otherwise, right? And, and somebody, somebody jumps a, a bird or somebody jumps a deer. How many, of you've been, how many of you have been in this situation before? Am I alone in this, like me and two other people, right? But i got to tell you, from personal experience, there's nothing that moves faster than a bird or a deer that's on its way out. Out of this room, we should tear out of here like a deer, right? Like an ant, like like an antelope <laughs> is the is the, the actual animal given here. Like that bird that's taken flight to save its life from the dog, right? Because we care so much about the other person and about the relationship, we don't care what's in our way. We don't care what else we had to do today. The most important, the only thing we can think about is making it right with that person. It's relational proactivity. Do people practice that today? <laughs> nope. We leave the texts unread. We let the email get buried. I'm talking from personal confession here, okay? Like, this is real, right? And we, and we got to take, take stock and say, why do I act this way? And the answer so often is because I don't share God's values and I need to ask him to implant this sound wisdom and discretion in my heart. That I would see that people are the most important thing. He gives the last, the last section, and we're kind of out of time, but the last section talks about vocational pro proactivity. And, and this is such a beautiful and also silly passage, right? You go to the ant giving the example, right, of, of what it looks like to work, what it looks like that God's expectation, if we're living in sound wisdom and discretion, is that we're going to look busy and purposeful. Not busy for no reason. <laughs> Not busy because we don't have, uh, we don't have um, <clears throat> boundaries and we can't say no, but because we know the vocational and the reason God's called us to, to live, the purpose he's put us here for, and we're busy doing it. And, and so the, the, we'll close with this. Sound wisdom 
and discretion says many of life's problems are solved by simply doing something. <laughs> so many of us are so busy trying to do, always make sure it's the right thing we're doing. We spend a lot of time sitting around not doing anything. And God looks at the sluggard, the lazy person, the person sitting around waiting for the right thing and says, actually, if you just went and moved some rocks around, you'd probably be further ahead. And there's two cultural lies that are addressed here. The one is that the good life is one of ease and relaxation, right? That's, that's what we all want as Americans, right? That's the dream. And he says, now look at what the ants do. They're always busy. They're always working. But guess what? There's another cultural lie that's addressed, and that's that lie that the goal is the hustle and the grind, right? Because that ant can go out, those ants can go out and try and get food all they want, but if God doesn't provide it for them, right? God doesn't protect them from the elements. They're not going to get, they're not going to survive, right? So the ant is this beautiful picture, right, of proactivity and reliance at the same time. I'm going to go in, I'm going to put in my shift today, doing what God's called me to do, and I'm going to allow him to, to, to work it out with these principles in my heart. Proactivity, <laughs> knowing, and, and people first. And if you're not spending your life, if you're not serving, if, if, you're, if you're not spending your life serving people, right? If that, I understand we might do, be doing a whole lot of different things, whether it's working in finance or working in lawn care or teaching or we're retired. Whatever your vocation, make it as unto the Lord. And the way that we do that is by making it about the people that are around us. Those are the top drawer tools. That's sound wisdom and discretion. Would you pray with me? Lord, we come to you humbly because we, we all have fallen short of sound wisdom and discretion. We've let them slip away, get tucked in underneath all the other junk that's in our toolbox. So thank you for this morning where we pull them out and we dust them off and we ask the question, how do I apply these things to the real life scenarios in my life? And I pray that if there's anybody out there who isn't walking with Jesus on a daily basis, that they would know that none of this works apart from a relationship with God. Unless, you are, unless we have died to ourself and have been united to Christ, unless we've confessed with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that he's risen from the dead, none of this works. And maybe that's the reason they're here this morning. Because life does not work apart from a relationship with the one who gave it to us. So Lord, I pray for wisdom. I pray that we would take these things not just as truths, but as advice. And that doesn't mean that we, that they're, <laughs> doesn't mean they're not true, but we would take it as something relational that you've given us specifically this morning. Advice. Here's how to handle this situation. Here's what I need to do today. You're so good to us, Father. Would you, would you lead us and guide us, continue to provide our every need? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sing with us. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. We sing.
give life, Lord. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the dawn. Like the image Ben gives us, Lord, if the ants toil all day, they're not going to get any further. If if you don't bless them with food, Lord God, it's just like the breath in our lungs, Lord God. You give it to us. And so with our voices this morning, I pray, I don't know where we are or where everyone's at, Lord God, but I pray that we would shout out your praises, Lord God, and worship. Lord, this week as we go out, Lord God, what are we doing with the things that you're giving us, Lord? Are we keeping it to ourselves? Are we, are we burying it under the dirt, Lord God, and, and just keeping it for ourselves? Are we, are we investing it, Lord God, in others? Lord, guide us, Lord, this week as we worship you through giving, giving this treasure out, Lord God. Help us this week to give out this treasure, Lord God, so it may invest and bring back double the fold, Lord God. Lord, great are you, Lord. 
I pray all these things. Your awesome heavenly name we pray. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody says amen. amen. It's good to see you guys this morning. Have a blessed week. Thank you.